decades ago, we knew almost nothing about the world's largest ray, one of the biggest fish in our ocean. Less than 10 years ago, the conservation status of this animal was still listed as data deficient, highlighting the fact that we didn't know very much about its ecology or population trends in the wild. Five years ago, we still thought there was a single species of manta roaming the world's oceans. People often refer to me as an obsessive speciologist. <laughs> um, uh, most people call me a conservation biologist, which is true, and now an emerging explorer. I don't know. Um, I'm actually just a girl that likes fish. <laughs> I uh, grew up inspired by great explorers, as probably many of you did, and, you know, the likes of Jacques Cousteau and Sylvia Earle and the eminent E.O. Wilson. Um, and these people really inspired me, and, and I admired their dedication and their passion. But most of all, I also appreciated that each one of them seemed to share a similar philosophy. They seemed to understand that it would take careful, long-term investigation to unravel ecological mysteries. And they chose to take us along for that journey. I uh, was in love with the ocean before I'd even been underneath the ocean. I was um, begging my parents to let me learn how to dive. I got certified on my 12th birthday. I uh, went to marine biology camps every single summer of my youth. I was, I was that kid. Um, and, and in graduate school, finally a marine biologist in my own right, I was just desperate to immerse myself in biological problem solving. I too, like Jane Goodall, wanted to just get out there, uh, do stuff, learn about a specific species. But I, I needed to travel, I needed to find my inspiration, figure out what it is that I was meant to do. And I was drawn to Africa, that's where I still live. And uh, there I was uh, inspired. I was inspired uh, at a workshop. Uh, for the IUCN, I was asked to come and help with conservation assessments for their red list. And uh, I was asked to help evaluate the, the status of the giant manta ray. And it became very clear to us that week that we know nothing about this animal, or we didn't at the time. Um, and it was not a real shocker that by the end of the week, we had to list this species as data deficient because we were unable to assess its <coughs> conservation status. You know, it was, it was an awful feeling, but the wheels had started to turn in my mind. I've been in love with mantas probably since the very first moment I saw one underwater. And if you haven't seen one, get out there and do it. These are awesome animals. Um, it's about the coolest you know, experience that you can have underwater with a fish. Uh, they are intelligent and curious. They have the largest brain of any fish. Uh, these are animals that behave like mammals, even though they're fish. They don't swim away from you. They swim towards you. They um, love to play. They're in, in curious. They, they engage you underwater. But for the first time, I was seeing them not as an animal that I love to dive with, not as an animal that I just like to take photographs of, but as an animal that had been overlooked, that needed scientific attention, my attention. And as happenstance would have it, um, I had been doing exploratory diving off the very remote and um, undeveloped coastline of Mozambique. And wow, what an awesome time of my life, you know, diving places that maybe no one had ever dove before, camping along uninhabited beaches. I would recommend it. It's a, a great experience. But as a biologist, what really um, moved me, what jumped out at me, was just the number of megafauna off this coastline, the abundance and diversity of megafauna. It was like the Galapagos of the Indian Ocean. Um, and you know, every day on the way to our dives, we were tripping over whale sharks, and there was huge pods of dolphins and whales, and um, you know, other threatened marine life, marine turtles, and mantas. Important distinction. Lots of them. So this was my opportunity. This is my opportunity to give back, do something. Um, an animal that had not been really um, worked on before, probably for lack of opportunity, and uh, a paucity of data that was hampering its conservation status. Um, listing. And so this was how I was going to contribute. This is how I was going to give back. And so I began the, the very slow road of trying to develop a research program out in the middle of nowhere on these animals. And it was rough going at first. It was logistically, what a nightmare. And it was expensive and messy um, oftentimes. I had to actually cash in my life savings um, as a young student to, to just fund a pilot study when my university in Australia found this idea a little out there. Um, and uh, the fact was, though, is that I was learning things, and I was inspired by that. We were learning amazing things, things that weren't in any of the current literature on these animals. So obviously, we were doing something right, and I wanted to keep going. What seemed like a near impossible goal for a 23-year-old American girl out in the middle of nowhere in Africa by herself slowly started to become something that could be possible, and people rallied behind my efforts there. It was so fantastic. 
Um, and in those early years, I had to remember that I needed to pace myself, that it had taken some of my greatest heroes a lifetime to tease out um, you know, this ecological information on the animals they were working on. And if I was going to go down that same road, I would have to expect that it was going to take me a long time, too. So well, like any good plan, I needed a strategy. And I thought back to the conservation assessment of this animal, it's data deficient. What was it missing? Biological information, um, life history parameters, abundance estimates, population trends. So that should be easy, right? Um, but I, I took each challenge as a separate issue, and, and I devised a way of how to attack it. My first issue was just, how do we study these animals in the wild? Um, people had already identified that manta rays have individual spot patterning on them. That's individual to different animals, you know, like a fingerprint. And what I wanted to know is, could I take this individual patterning uh, and use it as a mark, a permanent mark, and study these animals non-intrusively through photography, um, carefully just making observations of individuals over time and learning more about them, and then obviously collectively about populations that we were interested in? And the answer to every single one of those questions is a resounding yes, we can. I've now spent thousands of dives underwater carefully investigating these animals, learning more about them. We've learned about their natural behaviors, um, their really secretive behaviors like reproductive ecology. We've learned about their movements and their migrations. Uh, through this methodology, we were able to estimate for the very first time the abundance at a monitored site something that's never been attempted before. We learned about their natural pressures from predation, their not so natural pressures from us. I um, completed the first PhD program, uh, first PhD project on manta rays, demonstrating that these animals can and must continue to be studied in the wild. I'm happy to say that there are many, many uh, PhD studies underway now for manta rays. And in the middle of all of this, <laughs> we described a new species of manta. It's not my intention, it just kind of popped up, and it popped up early in my studies. And the reason for it is because no one had really spent time in the wild with these animals before. Natural observation just wasn't there. Um, and, it's, and it's not because they don't look different, because they do. Um, and they not just look different, they behave different. They lead different lives. To a large extent, they live in different places. So that wasn't the issue. I, uh, at that time, um, you know, my work had, had gone international. And I was doing work across the globe. And um, it was hard to ignore the, the growing global trends. Um, manta populations that were once stable were now in decline. There's rises in um, a new fishery for these animals where people would directly hunt mantas to extract their gill rakers to use in uh, a bogus Chinese medicinal tonic. And even though this was really disturbing, um, we were starting to say, we're going to fight back. We're going to use all the information that we've been ascertaining over the last decade to be able to, to fight this, to be able to work on conservation. And we did. Uh, we used all the information that we had to, to fight that data deficient red list assessment. And year after year, we kept reevaluating them until finally in 2011, they were declared a threatened species worldwide as vulnerable to extinction. And my research program changed overnight. I abandoned you know, work on just pure ecology, and, and I put all my focus into conservation. We started integrating technology into our research program so that we could better understand how to manage these, these animals and the populations um, in different areas of the world. Uh, deploying tags with advanced satellite technology, we were able to track these animals where they went, learn more about their migrations, learn more about their habits. And uh, this technology proved invaluable for us. We were able to understand for the first time that these animals travel long distances in short periods of time, use vast horizontal planes in the ocean, travel into the high seas, unprotected areas, and unbelievably are using really deep parts of our oceans, the bathypelagic parts of our oceans, over 4,500 feet from the surface. What they're doing down there? I don't know. To the people that say that there's nothing left to discover, that, that everything's been done, are you guys out of your mind? You know, ordinary people are discovering extraordinary things every day. Just pick up a National Geographic magazine, right? Um, and, you know, for us, we had totally underestimated this animal, myself included. And now that we had underestimated them and we were learning more about them, we needed to act. We needed to do something. So with my Ecuadorian team, we put together a proposal to list these animals on the Convention for Migratory Species Act. 
Um, it was a bold move, and we weren't sure if it was going to work. But because we had started collecting all of this information on these animals, the proposal was full of good science. And unbelievably, in 2011, manta rays became the very first ray species in history to be listed on this act. What about this uh, unsustainable international fishing trade I was telling you about? Well, that same Ecuadorian team and I put together a proposal not a year later um, to try and list these species, actually both species of mantas, on CITES. CITES is an intergovernmental treaty that aims to try and make sure that, that international uh, trade doesn't negatively influence our wild flora and fauna. Um, and my team in Mozambique took our 10-year data sets and, and put together a publication to demonstrate that there had been an 88% decline in our population in the south of Mozambique over the last 10 years in response to, apparently, um, a, a very small artisanal uh, fishery there. Um, and if that wasn't evidence enough of why we needed to protect them, we um, also demonstrated through our reproductive ecology work that these are some of the most um, conservative animals, uh, especially in, in the shark and ray group, that there, that there are. Um, manta rays have very small litter sizes. They only have one baby every two to three years or so on average. Um, to give it to you in other terms, uh, most shark and ray species will have more offspring in a single litter than manta rays will have over the entire course of their lifetime. So we started to use these, this different information in, in probably one of the most passionate appeals that I've ever seen to government uh, to try and get these animals listed on CITES. And in Bangkok this year in March, we were successful in getting them awarded um, Appendix 2 listing. It was just awesome. I was uh, really moved by international collaboration, researchers coming together for this common cause. I was really moved um, by the fact that the public was behind us. And I wanted to harness that passion and that support from the public. So I had this idea to create the first automated global online database for manta rays. Um, it's called Manta Matcher. It's not a manta ray dating site. <laughs> um, but what it's supposed to do is it's supposed to promote the ordinary people to pick up a camera and contribute to a global scientific initiative. And it helps researchers use their data and helps them share their data with other researchers because international collaboration is just so important. Um, and the result is quite literally one of the best examples that I've currently seen on you know, multidisciplinary approach to solving a wildlife conservation issue. Um, through you know, shared collaborative research and also public support. That's what we need to be striving towards, I think. Two decades ago, we knew almost nothing about the world's largest ray. What we have found out has shocked us, has broken natural records, has inspired us to evolve new ways to, of how to protect them. You know? It's, it's amazing what we can achieve. It's a real testament. It speaks to the heart of, of, of exploration and what we as humans can do if we set our mind to it. Obsessive speciologist? Maybe. <laughs> but I think the problems of the oceans are going to be solved one species at a time, region by region, saving one critical habitat after the next. That's what I believe. And I know that a lot of things need to change, how we as humans view the ocean, how we use this resource, our impacts on it. But I, I truly feel that we have to inspire exploration, and we have to allow people to be creative. We have to encourage people to dare to make a difference, to use each one of our individual talents. And we all have so many uh, to try and solve uh, these problems. I've taken on the challenge of trying to save some of the, the ocean's largest fish, and I'm trying to create a manta army to help me do so. Um, but I think if we're going to change the future of our oceans and change the future of our planet, uh, we need to encourage these people to dare to make a difference. We need more explorers. We need more ambassadors. We need more people to, to dream big. And I'm so proud to be a part of an organization now that is helping to to push that philosophy and, and, and who really believes in exploration. So thank you very much. And I look forward to talking with each and every one of you, hopefully over the course of this week.